Hello, everybody. Hi, Dave. All right, you're recording, and Mandy, I've made you host. Thank Have you so much, Athena. Okay, and Lindsay, are you ready? Yes. Excellent. Okay, so it is 2.04 p.m. and seeing a quorum of the Community Resources Committee present, I am calling this meeting to order. Uh, pursuant to Governor Baker's March 12th, 2020 order suspending certain provisions of the Open Meeting Law, MGL Chapter 30A, Section 18, this meeting of the Community Resources Committee is being conducted via remote participation. Um, at this time, I'm gonna call on a number of people, not just committee members to make sure we can hear you and you can hear us. So when I call your name, um, just say present to confirm that you are here. Um, I'm gonna start with the CRC members, which are Steve Schreiber. Here. Evan Ross. Here. Shalini Balmilm. I'm here. And Mandy Johanneke is here, and Sarah Swartz is not present yet. I confused Shalini by not starting with her. She was so ready. <laughs> and then I want to welcome, we have a number of chairs of various committees here that we have invited to talk about housing today. And so we're going to now call on them um, in no particular order. It is how they are on my screen. We're going to start with the ZBA chair, Steve Judge. Present and the Housing Trust Chair, John Hornick. Present. The CPA Chair, Sarah Marshall. Present. Planning Board Chair, Jack Jemsick. Here. And ECAC, or Energy and Climate Action Committee, <laughs> Chair, Laura Drocker. Here, thanks. Thank you. And Dave Zomek, you can hear us too. He, he holds his thumb up. So as, as I said, we have a number of chairs of various committees here. I want to thank all of those chairs for showing up. We, are, we invited the chair of the CDBG committee too, um, uh, Gail Lansky. Uh, she works till 3.30, so she cannot join us today. So I will be contacting her and we will be talking later this week to talk about what we're gonna talk about today. Um, with that, um, we are going to move straight to item 3A, which is presentation discussion items, comprehensive housing policy, the reason we are all here today. Um, and it is the first thing we're gonna do, and we hope to spend about an hour on this. Um, if we finish it early, we finish it early. If we don't, we'll, we'll re-gauge at three o'clock or so whether we should continue or move on to the other half of the plan. But we're gonna start with feedback. So the history of this is, the Housing Trust worked quite hard and came up with a draft affordable housing priorities policy that it presented to a number of committees, including the town council a while ago. And after that, um, CRC, this committee and the finance committee provided feedback to the council on that draft affordable housing priorities policy. And at that time, the council actually voted to use that feedback and the priorities policy draft and numbers of other documents and asked CRC to actually create a comprehensive housing policy that deals with all of housing, not just the affordable housing that the housing trusts work focused on. Um, and so we've been working on that for about almost a year now, probably. Um, and the draft that we've we're talking about today is the work from that referral. And it's been based on that draft affordable housing priorities policy, as well as our master plan, the housing market studies, um, the, the housing production plan, and a couple of other documents. Um, and from that, we've got what CRC thought was a decent enough draft of goals, objectives, introduction, and moving forward to start getting feedback from the town, um, residents, counselors, and committees. And what we wanted to do was talk to the chairs of the committees we thought would have have the most interest in this policy from the fact that this policy will hopefully guide decisions that each of your committees is making um, you know as the council is the policy chief policy setting body of the town and so we wanted spe feedback specifically from all of these committees and the committee the CRC committee as a whole thought the best start of that feedback would to bring everyone to bring the chairs together to talk about 
how we want it, but also what you guys think about how we should get that feedback and how that works and timing and all of that. Cause we didn't want to just send an email to all of you say with a document that says, here's this, give us feedback from your committee. And we didn't think that might be helpful to you or to us. So we're hoping we can have a conversation today around how best to get feedback from your committees. Um, what, what method, what, you know, what that might look like, the timing of that um, and, and all of that. But that's a little bit about the history of it. Um, does anyone from CRC want to add to that before we just dig right into the discussion on this? And I'm not seeing any raised hands. We all try to use the raise hand button since we have such a big committee and not seeing that we will, I'll, I'll just start then. Um, I, I brainstormed with a couple of questions that we, we could start with, um, you know, and I know um, John has provided some heads up on some things he would like to talk about. So first, first I wanna talk about, I guess, or the things I have is what, what do you guys need from us as CRC in order to best provide the feedback you're capable of prov providing as a committee or you know, even as individuals. Was the document we provided good enough? What would you want to hear from us as a committee? Do you need more documents? Do you need more of a history and a memo and things like that um, to, to make our request to you for feedback valuable to you so that you know how, how to respond? Um, and all. So, so that's one of the first things I think we could talk about, although I'm happy for this conversation to sort of meander around all sorts of things, depending on where people think their time is most valuable spent today. So John. Okay, I'll respond to the question that you just asked. Um, and I want to say that um, it will be difficult for me to ask the housing trust at this point in time to do a full review and provide feedback on the document that you have distributed. However, I do have an alternative, um, which I think, which I hope you will recognize as a valuable opportunity. Um, for various reasons, Tom Kegelman has just resigned his position as a member of the Housing Trust. Um, however, he was probably the most important person in the development of our affordable housing policy. Beyond that, he is a developer, a not-for-profit developer. He is the executive director of Home City Housing that is based in Springfield. And much of his career has been devoted to affordable housing. So, I think you need somebody with that kind of background and experience to get into the detail and to help you move forward. Because I think you really do have an excellent start. I frankly appreciated the longer version of the document, which I understand is still drafty from your point of view. Um, but my immediate reaction was that um, you need someone like Tom, really, to participate on an ongoing basis to improve that document and to give it, in, in a sense, the uh, strength of someone who really knows about affordable housing and housing development. So that's my recommendation. I think having one person who you allow to be essentially a non-voting member of the CRC when it comes to uh, discussing the uh, comprehensive housing policy would be something that I strongly recommend. I think it's the best way, frankly, of getting feedback from the Housing Trust. Thank so, you for that. It, it, have you finished? Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, so that's my recommendation. You know, I, as you said, I have other things to say, but since you in, introduced the question of how the CRC can best get ideas and feedback um, from each of us, 
that's my recommendation. Tom, frankly, um, would be better than me or is better than me because he has much more knowledge and experience than I have. Thank you. Sarah. So you need to unmute Sarah. Thanks for inviting me to this. So on behalf of CPA, um, I have two thoughts right now. And one is, what is your time frame? Because we've just wrapped up the major business of our committee. Um, I can call the meeting at any time uh, and, and may in fact do so in January for some specific items we had put off until we had more time. So um, I guess I, yeah, I wanna know <laughs> what is your time frame for getting our feedback. Um, second of all, you, am I right in thinking that you want kind of a formal, um, a formal document or you know, email, whatever it is, from the committee as a whole that we all deliberate about this? Or is just uh, in comments of individual members of CPA committee helpful, or they can just send them to me and I forward them. Um, and then thirdly, um, I'm curious, and I, I think this touches on a discussion Evan and I had a few months ago. Um, I'm curious about whether you see this policy, whatever it turns out to be, as um, setting CPA's housing, affordable housing, priorities, our direction. Um, obviously, the need is so great, we could spend all of our money for the foreseeable future on, <laughs> on affordable housing projects, at least, you know, once we've met the 10% um, th thresholds. But of course, there are lots of private efforts that are, we have found very worthy. So yeah, I'm, we react, you know, we, re we react to the proposals that are sent to us. So yeah, I'm wondering how you see this as directing or just informing our deliberations around the, the variety, the great variety of housing proposals we get. Thank you for that. So I will answer one question, but I'm actually gonna throw a bunch of those questions back to the chairs themselves. One of the things that that we're here for is to discuss that time frame because you know as as a CRC committee, you know, as I said, we've been working on this for a while and we're only about halfway done, if that, right? Because um, we haven't even been able to talk about the strategy section. And so time frame's a big one. You know, I, I think this committee would like to see it get referred or recommended back to the council for adoption by the end of this. Um, uh, I guess it's not this year, <laughs> by the end of 2021, not, not in two weeks, um, you know, but by the end of 2021, earlier, better, six months and all, but, but we don't want to, you know, we recognize every committee has its own ebb and flow of a year. Um, CPA is almost done, but I think CDBG, who's, you know, is just starting up and ramping up. And then you've got planning board and ZBA that really do sometimes get a lot and pound it and then maybe not have a lot. So, so that's one thing I'd like to actually throw back to the committee chairs is how much time do they possibly have to provide this feedback if it's in a meeting. In terms of um, formality and all, that's, that's another thing that we wanted to you know, I'm not sure CRC has decided how, and I think that's something we wanted to talk about in, in terms of what do we, what do you as chairs think would be the best way to give feedback to us, the easiest way to give feedback to us. We're not looking to burden any committee with, you know, extensive requirements or anything. Um, if, if, the group of chairs believes that the easiest thing to do is to send it out with a memo from CRC to all of its committee members for response back to us. Um, and if they think that would be the easiest and most valuable way for us to get the feedback, that might be what we decide. Um, if you would rather each handle it differently, you know, John, John proposed 
that maybe we use instead of the whole housing trust because they have a lot on, on their plate, we try and seek Tom Kegelman's input sort of in the housing trust stead. Each, each committee could potentially decide to do this differently depending on where they think their time is used most valuably for this. Um, and then to, to get to your last one, and I see your hand, Sarah, but let me, let me try to answer the last one, which is, um, you know, in terms of does this set the policy of the CPA, that is something in a new form of government <laughs> we, I'm not sure we could fully answer. And we're still trying to figure out that the charter does give the council the policy, you know, as the chief policy setter for the town. Um, you know, we have adopted um, from Laura's committee, uh, climate action goals, uh, goals, plan, goals, we're at goals. Um, we're not at the plan yet, but they're gonna bring a plan to us. Um, you know, and, and those are something that we've then forwarded onto the manager. So I think that that question can't fully be answered, but I think the goal would be that this policy when adopted by the council would not only guide the council's actions, um, but because we're the policy setter for the town may help guide the actions of the other committees. Hence, we're, we want to talk to the other committees because this might directly affect your work. Um, you know, that, that being said, um, that's just me speaking as CRC chair and a former charter commissioner, not the council as a whole. I, we don't even know what the council hasn't really talked about it is what I can say, but, but it would, I think we're looking for guidance documents, you know, this will eventually have strategies and measurables on it. So hopefully it would be used by everyone to guide their decisions. That doesn't mean it would dictate the decisions though, I don't think. Um, so Sarah, and then I, I see John's hand again. I know Sarah, you were raising your hand. So, <laughs> so I wanna go back to you. Um, um, and Steve Judge, so we'll, we'll hear from Sarah and then we'll go to Steve and then John. Okay, thank you. Um, so so the, the feedback that you want in some form from the committee by some method, committees, is that on the whole policy or just on this measurable section that is the focus for today? Because, because um, I mean, any of us as just residents of Amherst might have opinions about all kinds of aspects of this draft, but as CPA members, if, you know, our focus would be much, much narrower and we'll need to know what to tell folks, you know, what the level, <laughs> what the level of, of review expected is. So, all right, and now. Yeah, so, so we would be looking at getting the feedback in the position of CPA member or housing trust member um, or you know planning board member as opposed to potentially re random resident and their thoughts on housing. Um, beyond that, um, you know that that could be done per through a committee discussion or it could be done individually. Um, Steve. First, thanks for um, seeking input from the ZBA. I appreciate it. Um, and I'm, we're, it's something we're all interested in. I'm particularly interested in the housing pol town's housing policy. I, I just make a couple of points. Uh, number one, like other committees, we pretty much finished up our work for the year. Last Thursday, we decided we weren't probably going to meet again until late January. Um, now we can meet in the, in the interregnum if we need to. We can call a meeting, but we probably don't have um, anything from the board members' plans, they don't anticipate any kind of work in the first part of January. And then I think we have a pretty full schedule coming up in January and February. But um, so I think the way to get the best response from the ZBA members is to recognize that for the most part, it's a pretty new committee. Um, Keith and myself are the only people that have been there for very much time on the committee. And most people haven't been involved with the, the town government. And so I think what would be helpful for us would be to have some kind of a memo out, outlining the, the process you're using, how, this would, how, our, how our comments would fit into that process and inform the work of the council and the CRC. And then have either Dave or somebody work with Chris and Rob and, and uh, Maureen and have a meeting at which we could discuss this openly as a group. 
um, after having a chance to review the documents that you asked us to, to comment on. And I think that would be really helpful. Uh, probably be the best way to do this is to give some education, allow members to have a, some, a chance to look at this and then have an active, uh, active administrative meeting, which would be open to the public, but it would be a way for the, the ZBA members to discuss this. And then I think that probably the best way to give feedback to you would be for the ZBA to empower me to, uh, to um, transmit through whatever methods I thought was best, transmit our, our goals and views back to you for your information. That would probably be helpful for us. Thank you for that. Um, John. I uh, just had two comments. Um, one is when you set a deadline, I think it would be good to complete the work before the next elections for town council, because it would be too bad if you completed the work, uh, you know, and then it presented it to a new council rather than the existing council, because it would cause, honestly, probably some kind of chaos in the sense that the new council would say, well, we didn't do this. Uh, and uh, it's something that has to start over again almost. So I would encourage you to finish, if not in six months, then in eight or nine months, so that it's not an issue with the new council. Uh, the other thing I wanna say is, when I suggested or recommended that you contact Tom Kegelman and ask him to be a part of your ongoing process, I did not mean to say that uh, I would not share the draft with the housing trust members and ask them to provide feedback, which I could organize. But I do think the most important thing is that you have someone with that point of view as part of your ongoing process. And I think Tom is your best bet. Thank you for that clarification, John. I'm sorry I misunderstood um, well, I wasn't clear. what that recommendation was. Um, I, I, I want to pull, I, I see Jack's hand. Um, so Jack, and then I actually want to pull um, the chairs on the question Sarah asked, which was, what parts are we looking for feedback on? Um, so Jack and then Laura, and then I'm, I'm going to ask my question. Yeah, I just, um, you know, agree with a lot of what Steve said with regard to, you know, we have, uh, you know, plenty of planning board members that will have different opinions and kind of pulling all those together, we could do it as a group and have one list um, or have people directly report to CRC. It's a, it's an interesting thing. Um, peripherally, we haven't really um, try to tackle the housing policy per se, just I think we, you know, we have general support for what the housing trust is doing and, and recognize the, I call it a housing crisis. And it's not only Amherst, it's, it's Western Mass and uh, the whole state, basically. So I think we need to bear, you know, keep that in mind. Uh, and on top of that, Amherst has all these outlier situations that make us even more unusual and more of a challenge, I think, to, to, uh, to make something work, given you know, all the, the higher education facilities here and the student needs and, and, and that. But uh, I'm, all, I'm open to whatever uh, the CRC would like for us. You know, I'm not, uh, I'm not suggesting anything right now, but I just give you let us know what you think will be best. <laughs> You've got a lot of cats in the in the in the audience right now, so. <laughs> Thanks, Jack. Laura, you had your hand up at one point. Yeah. Thanks, Mandy Joe. Um, thanks for including ECAC in this discussion and for including um, some great. Uh, thoughts on the sustain sustainability of of this policy, the sustainability pieces in this policy. Um, you know, ECAC meets quite regularly, um, so collecting feedback probably won't be a problem. I think, from a timing perspective, the challenge is, is that we are, as you alluded to, working on our climate action and resiliency plan, um, which will have a section focused on buildings. Um, 
and will be finalized, I think, mid-year. So I think one of the coordinate coordinations we might want to think about is how to determine what what's coming first and where the I think what we don't want to have is having language inconsistent language if if we can avoid it um you know maybe one's more specific specific than the other um but you know kind of talking through how, which which we would um kind of which would be the in the, the kind of the thing we're relating to most when we're talking about housing and sustainability is it the climate action plan or is it this plan um and then the other the one that it's not would be maybe more general and so i think that that's something that um i'm sure ecac members would have opinions on but it may be just a, a separate conversation as well to work through some of those those ideas um so that's my main question i guess is just to i i, I agree with steve it'd be helpful to have that background information um, to share with the committee on how this was developed. I think the other point piece that I um, would be interested in knowing, and perhaps this is something you're planning on doing, is what pieces, I think this is a really helpful policy at a high level. Um, something we're thinking about with the climate action plan is, you know, for each of our actions, we're identifying who's the lead on that. Is it the town council? Is it the, the manager? Is it the state and federal government, like where are we seeing the leading happening? And I think for this policy, similarly, it, it'd be helpful to understand um, what groups are leading these actions um, and how these actions might might take take form. Thank you. Um, that was great. So I want to go back to. I, I think it's been hinted at by a number of people, but um, Sarah asked it sort of directly, which was what part are we asking for feedback on? Um, and we originally sent out, um, I originally sent out at the, at the committee's request, the sort of what I called the abbreviated portion of the policy, the introduction, the goals, the objectives, and the moving forward section before you get into um, strategies and measurables. And that was done because we wanted to start getting feedback earlier instead of waiting for the whole thing to be at a position that the committee had been able to talk to, talk about. Um, but then I heard, you know, John, John asked me, where's the rest of the policy? I think I've heard it from a couple of others. Like, and, and then obviously when I sent everyone the, the packet for today, because everyone's welcome to stay for the second half of the meeting too, when we're talking, it, starting the discussion, the first real discussion we'll ever have on the measurable section, um, everyone got to see the rest of it. Um, and so I guess one thing that would be helpful to us as CRC was, is um, do, would, pe would the committees wanna start with sort of a partial policy or would they want to see, um, you know, do they wanna start with it in, I, I'm not sure how to word this, but in that, that just those sections that CRC is comfortable with because it's had its time to go over them or would it rather start with something that might not be as finished and or would it rather wait to start giving its feedback until CRC is comfortable with the whole document um, which would I guess be more towards the end of a CRC process but not the end because obviously we're still talking about it but but hearing from people from the committee chairs when they got sent this partial policy and what the reaction to that was and how you think you could give feedback on that or whether you need the whole thing and if so when's the right time to start that feedback I think would be really helpful to us because it's something as CRC has struggled with when do we start saying we really want to distribute this out for feedback and when do we kind of hold back on that um, Steve you had your hand up yeah, so just to, you know, as part of the conversation, everyone from the other committees here has a different lens on this particular subject based on the board that they're on, like the ZBA and the planning board being the quasi judicial boards see projects that they um, think 
you know, that I'm sure that, that Steve and Jack have opinions about certain kinds of projects that come before them or that where they see, you know, glitches in the zoning bylaw or, you know, the, whatever, the land use, various land use, use laws and have an idea of what could be tweaked in order to make certain kinds of projects, you, you know, more, you know, easier to accomplish. So we, we do hear from the planning board from Jack you know, quite a bit. We hear less from the Zoning Board of Appeals because they're less part of that process. But for me, that would be the really interesting part of this is to get the perspective of the, you know, the boards that deal, really deal with the front lines here on projects that seem sensible that cannot be approved or projects that seem not sensible that are approved and, and um, how we can then work together in addressing the housing issues. So the housing issues are both affordable housing, but then also market rate housing. So we're, we know we're talking about the whole spectrum of housing. So that, that's something that I, I would very much hope to get out of you know, our discussion with the chairs. Thank you, Steve. Um, I'm gonna go to you, John. I know you don't have your hand up, but I know you had an opinion on, I, you shared it with me early on, you wanted to see the whole policy and you thought it would be really hard to, at least I, I, I'm sure you will correct me. You had concerns about being able to give feedback on goals and objectives without actually seeing strategies and measurables. So could, could you talk a little bit more about that? Uh, sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, to me, just the kind of what I consider the highlights of the policy are interesting, but it really is hard to evaluate what you want to do without uh, other material that I appreciate the fact that you added. I understand it's still draft, that's fine. Um, I think from my point of view, um, drafts should be shared with us on an ongoing basis. I don't know whether that's maybe every month or every two months or every six weeks, something in between, so that to the extent we're able to, we can give you feedback as you go along. I'm not comfortable with the idea that we give you some feedback now and then we give you some feedback before uh, you think you finalized everything, uh, which is also one reason why I think it's important to have someone who really knows housing as part of your group. Uh, and I appreciate the fact that you have Steve Schreiber, who I'm gonna say really knows zoning as part of your group, since that's become a significant piece in what you intend to do. Something, again, that I appreciate. So there's lots of things in the extended uh, draft that I think are very helpful um, and that are important and that I and probably others have comments on. So I think that's the biggest piece and uh, uh, there needs to be a way of providing not only comments now, but an ongoing basis. Um, and as I said, you have Steve to look at Steve uh, Schreiber to talk about uh, what the consequences might be for zoning. And that's why I wanted you to add someone like Tom Cagle, even as a non-voting member for housing. And the other chairs may have people in mind who they think you might consider to add to your meetings on housing as a non-voting regular member. Thank you. Um, we've got three hands up, so we're just I'm just going to take them in order. Laura. Yeah, I would um, agree that I think if you sent just the summary. Um, policy out for comment, you're probably gonna get a lot of comments that start to get to these other parts of the document um, that you've already thought about. So I think to the extent that even though it's draft and I'm assuming that because it's connected to this meeting, it's already a public document as it is, um, you know, having uh, the committee's comment now on this draft document or maybe a slightly updated version uh, after your conversation today makes sense. Um, I don't think ECAC would need to follow it super closely, but I think we would also like the opportunity to review it again at the end. And then of course, as I mentioned before, bring to you all um, drafts of our sections of our plan so that we can make sure the language is, is aligned as much as possible. 
so I would vote for, yeah, like let's, let's review. And I, I, I do think it'd be helpful to, to, you know, give us specific sections. I think for ECAC, it's pretty clear what sections we need to, to review. Um, uh, you know, that would also help. Thank you. Um, Sarah. Um, so the more I, the more I think about this, um, the more limited I think CPA's um, role is, although I'm happy to be corrected. Um, the, the policy is, addresses um, the desire to develop additional affordable and market rate housing, which is great. But the CPA statute lets us award funds or rather recommend that funds be awarded um, to other kinds of community housing projects as well, like rental assistance or, or um, renovating or, you know, um, attending to the capital needs of some, some um, affordable housing that is, is already present, already owned by the town, I would assume. So I, I don't see that we have a stake in what the policy says, I think our only need is to understand what it means for our decision-making process. Because again, we don't, you know, we don't have any um, special expertise in how to do this. We just re <laughs> we review proposals um, uh, in light of the Community Preservation Act law and and practices and um so I, you know to me it's like well whatever the policy is that's that's what we take into account but again i think what i will be most concerned to understand is is how we balance that policy against the other ways in which we can support or recommend that community housing be supported thank you uh steve you know, um, I, I think that what would be most helpful for the ZBA members to give you valuable feedback or worthwhile feedback would be to get to, to view the, uh, the objectives and the measurables as soon as possible. I think the goals are something that we don't have a lot of expertise on. Um, we're sort of where the rubber meets the road. And in many ways, I think Steve Schreiber is right. We're sort of an adjudicative body where we get the um, almost quasi-judicial. We get, here's what the, the, the zoning laws allow. We try to, bylaw allows, we try to balance off what we hear from the neighbors and from the, the applicant, et cetera, et cetera. So, but we, we, we are kind of where the rubber meets the road. And I think your policy, your goals are great for the most part. I would add one or two things, but, and I think there's some value in the ZBA responding to that. But I think our expertise and the way we can help you the most would be when we get to the specific um, ob uh, objectives and measurables. And I would like to have that available to the ZBA for comment to you sooner rather than later. And so um, I'm not sure, because we just started a project uh, last week where, we, where I asked them to take a look at the zoning law, zoning bylaw, because I know that's being looked at and see if there's any recommendations that we have for the planning board. Um, and so we've started this, you know, trying to be uh, involved in this process, but I wanna use their time um, effectively and judiciously. And I think the place we can be most valuable is in the, the objectives and the measurables. So that's what, when you asked about what we'd like to see, I think that would be what we'd like to see. Let me clarify that before I go to John. Um, so the goals and objectives are what you first saw. Are you talking about the objectives or are you talking about the strategies, the specific things? You that... know, I'm, I always had trouble between strategies and objectives my <laughs> entire career. Because <laughs> the goal would be to have better language for this. And it's not your fault, but that's across the board. So what I'm, what I'm looking at is the second part, the second document that you sent, which are the um, goal. Um, that has all, I guess the strategy, strategies yeah, strategies and measurables this, were added to that. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure I was priority. understanding yep. what you were saying and translating it properly. <laughs> you, you did. <laughs> so we, I, I guess many of us have that uh, problem of not getting that all straight. 
keeping that straight. Thank you. It's been tough for us too. So <laughs> thank you, um, John. Um, I have a couple of comments. Part yes. of it is listening to Sarah. Um, the housing trust has relied primarily on CPA funding. And quite honestly, I think that the CPA committee has been very generous in funding housing related projects. If you look back over the last three, four years, I mean, they're currently at a level that's close to half a million dollars a year when you include uh, the money that goes to pay for bonding of past projects as well as current money. So Community Preservation Act funds at this point are the largest source um, for doing the kinds of things that you want to do. Uh, so it's also important to think about other sources that could come, for example, uh, a real estate transfer fee is something that might help us out. Uh, a number of towns have, can't remember what the right term is, have uh, asked the legislature uh, to allow them individually to do a real estate transfer fee. So far, the legislature has not acted on those or acted on a general transfer fee, although there is legislation to propose it. So that's one example of something that the town could do that would expand the available funds. And we need to think about other things. Housing trust members have asked, okay, where can we get more funds so that we're not just relying on CPA into the future? Um, I think at the end of the day, there will be implications for what we want CPA to do and how we would spend the half a million dollars or so that they, they uh, allocate each year. And so that's something I think that the CPAC ought to have some input on. Um, I'm not sure I agree with Sarah when she says, well, we just wait to see what proposals come in. I think they could have a role in encouraging more proposals of one kind or another, and that the overall uh, housing plan that you're working on um, would provide some direction for that. Thank you, Sarah. Well, I would say um, my experience on CPA is just three years or at least three rounds so far. It's been less than three years, I think. Um, and we have not in those three years, certainly requested proposals that, uh, that limit in any way what the CPA law allows funds to be awarded for. So to my knowledge, we haven't ever said, we're really interested in housing proposals this year, or we're really interested in buying up homes and convert, you know, we have, we have not, not given any specific guidance about um, our, you know, we haven't made decisions ahead of time about how to, whether to focus or how to focus um, the recommendations. Um, you know, we do want to better publicize the CPA program and encourage just more, more applications generally. Um, but we've not directed directed uh, applicants to focus on certain kinds of projects. Um, also, I would say about the funding, um, <laughs> I, I found myself hoping that there's there are ideas for other funding sources because I don't think CPA can keep this up, <laughs> um, and nor might it want to, given given a large number of other kinds of projects which are have have started to come our way and which might um, the committee might wish to, you know, for a while, maybe direct outsize uh, grants to historic preservation or, you know, or recreation open space projects. So um, I don't think you're going to get 50 units a year, new units of affordable housing a year, just out of CPA money. Thank you. Um, I want to give 
my committee, CRC members, a chance to comment, bring their thoughts given what they've heard. Um, are there any comments or thoughts on how we might continue this conversation and also continue to the feedback section um, before we, you know, we're getting close to moving on to the measurables, but um, my second half of the plan for this meeting, but any thoughts from my fellow committee members on moving the feedback forward and progressing on it? Evan? Yeah, so first of all, thank you to all the chairs uh, for coming today. This is this was actually really useful um, because I think that it has probably changed the way we were going to do um, feedback dramatically. And so um, I'm glad we're able to bring you all here today to hear your thoughts um, because it sounds like I think I heard sort of unanimously across all chairs that you don't want to give feedback to just the first two sections of, of the policy, that it really makes sense to do the whole policy, even if it is still in a pretty rough draft form, which, you know, those strategies are in a pretty rough draft form still, because we, we really haven't gone through them. They're sort of like kitchen sink, like literally everything that people thought of good or bad, possible or impossible were sort of thrown in there, although much of them did come from um, the housing production plan, the master plan, and the, um, the real estate market study. Um, so I think that's useful. I think that um, what was interesting for me to hear is that also um, feedback might look very different from each committee and come at different times. So it sounds to me from what I heard Laura say and correct me if I'm if I'm misrepresenting what you said that um, the most useful feedback from ECAC might not actually come until they have a, a further draft of the climate action plan because that's when because the most useful feedback from ECAC might be how similar and how consistent or at least making sure there's no contradictions or conflict between the two policies and so ECAC might not I don't know what the timeline is for the climate action plan but it might not make sense for us to actually even ask for feedback from ECAC until they have a better sense of the building section on that. Um, and then from CPAC, Sarah said, you know, what, what are we looking for? Um, and I think what I'm really interested in is if you, if you looked at the draft, the longer draft document under the strategies for the final goal, which is align and leverage municipal funds, there are a lot of things in there that I think would really influence the decision-making of CPAC, a lot of which came from the original housing policy that the trust sent us um, a year ago, things about um, adopting um, maximum, what was it? Maximum, maximum per unit cost policies, um, things about giving precedence to preservation over new development. I mean, things that I think in theory would, would impact the decision-making of, of CPA if this was adopted. And I think, I think hearing from CPA would be useful on that and hearing a little bit about what they see their role as in the implementation of this policy. Because I think that Sarah brought up an interesting point that we had a, a lovely discussion about um, that I referenced in a prior CRC meeting without naming the CPAC member, but since she outed herself about um, what the role is between the council and CPAC and who, who determines CPAC priorities and, and, and that relationship. And I think that um, that's going to be a really important thing that we as CRC and we as the council have never really taken on, um, nor has I think CPAC. And so, and that's, I think this, this policy really highlights um, that relationship. And so I think um, hearing from CPAC about sort of what they see their role in this policy as far as implementation and what the relationship between the council is, um, is really useful. Um, and so for, for me, it sounds like um, our, our committee, CRC, needs to get the strategies very quickly to a place where we're comfortable sending them out. I think we're, we're almost there. Um, it's just we haven't actually even fully read them as a committee yet. So I think we have to at least have the committee have read them. But I'm actually fairly comfortable send, sending, having had this conversation, sending out something that is still a little bit rough, especially since, as Laura acknowledged, it's already a public document, so um, it's already it is already out there um, and getting feedback, but also letting the committees determine when they would best be prepared to give feedback and accepting that some committees might want to do it in January and some committees might it might not make sense to get it from them until March. 
So that's, I guess, my takeaways from this conversation, which has actually completely changed how I thought we would do this, but in a good way. Thank you, Evan. Shalini. Yeah, I just want to also acknowledge all the work that everyone's put into it to get to this place. Um, and I, I, I think I have a clarifying question, which might um, help us move, which would also inform the process is, there are like a lot of suggestions taken from different places. For example, let's say the housing production plan and um, which makes sense that it feels like work has been done earlier, maybe affordable housing trust, all these different places and we're kind of putting it all in this housing it in this one document. And my question was that with, when the housing production plan, for example, made those recommendations, were they based on like, we don't know what the impact is going to be on, you know, the, like, do we, let's say, making, allowing duplexes and this and that. And I think all of these different strategies. And so at what point does the impact of that, when is that study? Like, we're providing these strategies that we're saying we should, moving forward, study the impact of that or and that's gonna happen later? Or like, what is the purpose of these strategies? Like, they're supposed to guide who to do what is, I'm like, I'm not still clear about the impact of these things. And then something that John brought up in as one of the questions was like, I think it's really important is also, we might have idea strategies, but what are the challenges in implementing them? And I mean, even like, having spoken to people about uh, incentivizing developers to build more affordable housing. And so even though we may have uh, subsidies and incentives, it seems like the paperwork and all of that is so challenging that many people don't, they prefer not to go that route. So like really also including listening in when we're talking about feedback, talking to developers and maybe having, as John was saying, Tom, Tom on board or someone who can reflect that voice. So, hearing the challenges from the people who are gonna be implementing some of these like developers and talking, bringing them, getting their feedback might be important at some point. And um, yeah, that's, that's all. Thank you, Shalini. Um, any other thoughts from our committee, uh, from the CRC members? It is almost three o'clock and I know a number of people have to leave by three. Um, any other last things any of the chairs want to give us as <laughs> CRC members um, on thoughts in terms of feedback or you know process on feedback and all, or even feedback. Um, and then I, I will, Evan did actually a fairly good job of summarizing the conversation. So I'm not going to re-summarize it. I, I will just say, I heard what Evan heard in sort of the summary, and I do think we will be changing our strategy as a CRC when we come together again to d discuss how to do it and, and get things done. Um, but but let's, last thoughts from, from chairs. Steve, judge. Um, is this a good place just to comment on the goals? Yeah. Is this where would you like, okay. Sure. Yeah, I, I think the goals are, are great. I really do. I think that they, they res they add, you know, I think they respond to the way Amherst would like, as a town would like to deal with housing. We've got real problems. We've got to deal with, with um, and got to provide more production and we've got to figure out a way to have more affordable housing and subsidized housing in Amherst. I think the goals are good, but I think we didn't address one elephant in the room that needs to be addressed. And that's on the last goal aligning align and leverage municipal funding and other resources to support affordable housing. I think we have to affirmatively engage UMass as a, and see them as a partner and hopefully a provider of more housing. And I noticed under the, 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 the housing plan or the, uh, the, the master, I think it's your recent document, the master plan for the town, um, that we have about 35% of the housing is group homes, group housing or congregate housing. And that's normally in most of Massachusetts, about 3.5%. So 
So we haven't, when we know that that's a lot of students living in what was big old houses. And I think we really need to affirmatively as a town engage with the, with the university to see if there's ways we can creatively incentivize them or work with them to create more housing on campus, whether it be through, you know, I don't know if they do dorm dormitory bonds anymore or if there's a way that they can work with private developers to do that because that is one of the big drivers. It's a huge driver of the problems that we're facing is the growth in UMass and that growth in time. So I think that's something that should be one of our goals. I don't have the answer, obviously, <laughs> But I just know that that's something that we ought to, I think that's something we ought to think about. So that would be my personal response to the goals that, that are uh, enumerated in your first draft. Thank you, Steve. Laura. Yeah, just quickly, because I have to run to a meeting uh, back to my regular job here. Um, uh, thank you for including us. I think what I'll tell ECAC tomorrow in our meeting is that we had this conversation and we should be looking for more details and a draft to review sometime in the new year and um, look forward to talking more about that as needed. I, I would say that's accurate. And I do wanna thank you for taking the time out of your day to, to come. I know you're, you gotta get to another meeting. So thank you for taking the time. Uh, Jack. Yeah, I just wanted to, Follow up, you know, Steve felt like we had a lot of input uh, and from, you know, boots on the ground sort of experience and we do. Um, and I can go through, you know, a few of those items, but um, with regard to the goals, and I know this is a comprehensive, you know, policy, but I'm wondering if, if it making it too comprehensive defeats the purpose as in, uh, as Steve said, the first two bullets are right on. Um, and I'm wondering about the third and fourth, the, the create safe, secure, environmentally healthy housing. Doesn't current building code kind of dictate that they're gonna be safe homes? I mean, um, I don't know how you cannot build a safe home. You wouldn't be allowed by code. So I'm just wondering about, you know, rising that to a level of your energy to address that when it's already kind of going to be addressed by virtue of, of, of how we do things this, you know, day and age. And then, you know, when we have a housing crisis and we certainly have climate concerns, but I, I don't know, I it really, it's nice to have climate. Uh, stated everywhere, uh, sustainability and all that. But this is about housing. And I just, <laughs> it's like, um, so to me, I, I would reduce the goals somewhat. Uh, just my opinion. This is not a planning board thing, but this is my opinion. And um, and then just to speak to, to what Steve, you know, has mentioned, we're, when we get a project, we have lots of zoning issues. First and foremost is parking. Second is, you know, setbacks and height of buildings, massing, um, you know, amenities and, and all that. So, um, so, you know, when we're talking about housing policy, we're also talking, we've got the zoning bylaw reform rewrite that goes along, you know, with this. And now we're staring at a 40R proposal for downtown that we want to take very seriously. And that comes with a lot of heavy lifting, you know, in terms of, you know, what's gonna, what's gonna fit, what's gonna, what's gonna be consistent with, you know, what the town wants. Um, and then Steve mentioned uh, UMass being the elephant in the room. I, I also kind of like <laughs> tax revenue is another elephant in the room. The town needs to is limited in terms of. Where we're getting money, we don't have commercial industrial. Over fifty percent is you know non-taxable with regard to our open space and recreational areas and and uh, land owned by higher education. So we're in a pickle, and so those that those are just my gut, you know, reactions, in no you know real order, <laughs> but. 
I'm, I'm very interested in terms of what you're going to give us for our marching orders. And <laughs> thank you for that, Jack. Uh, John. Um, I want to comment on what Steve Judge said, as well as on what Jack just said. Uh, a couple of things related to that. Um, one is I do believe that uni the university is the elephant in the room and the housing trust has made efforts to encourage the university to develop more residential units on campus. They had a plan to do that, but the plan has been stopped by uh, the COVID pandemic and I'm not sure whether they'll resume it. I also would say that the size of the plan was not very ambitious given the, the need for uh, students to have residential options on campus. So I think, again, agreeing with Steve, that's something important that somehow ought to be considered in your document. Uh, the, uh, no. the, another thing that came up is that Steve mentioned was uh, financing or lever leveraging town money and so forth. I do think that's important. And I think that the report should include both rough financial estimates of each of the initiatives to the extent that you can do that. And also rough estimates of where additional resources might come to pay for them. <clears throat> I think at the end of the day, when you add up the two, which is resources that we need to implement the various goals and resources that are available, it's gonna be clear that it's gonna be hard to do the former because we don't have enough of the latter. Um, and therefore priorities do need to be set. So I think that uh, it would be helpful to tackle that issue because those are questions that the finance committee will certainly be asking when the draft, when this draft document is circulated to the entire town council. Um, with respect to Jack's comment about sustainability, um, we're now in the process of writing an RFP uh, for hopefully uh, new affordable housing development on the property we we're in the process of acquiring on Belgiatown Road and the old state school. We include in that uh, requirements uh, for sustainable uh, uh, construction so that the buildings um, use are, or are most efficient with respect to what they do. We don't go as far as requiring net zero development, but we go as far, honestly, as the Department of Housing and Community Development goes in financing this these kinds of developments, um, which is not nothing. Uh, there are various requirements and they promote uh, in their request for proposals, uh, the use of su sustainable approaches to housing. Uh, so I think it is important and there is an issue to wrestle with honestly about whether Developments like this that use some town funds should be net zero or should be consistent with the uh, uh, current requirements of the Commonwealth's uh, Department of Community and Housing Development. If we wanted them to be net zero, then there's a question of where the additional resources to make that happen would come from. Thank you, John. Um, Steve Schreiber and then Shalini, and then we're going to move on to the second half of the housing policy discussion, which is the measurables brainstorming. So Steve. Yeah, so um, the university is an elephant, but it's also uh, maybe a cow. And by that, I mean both a sacred cow and a cash cow, you, you know, in other words, so, so I'm actually looking around looking all around me and there's houses around me that rent to students and those those guaranteed sort of rentals are enabling family members to stay in houses that they wouldn't be able to stay in and they also create you know cause diversity in, in certain neighborhoods where if it's a balance 
it's a really good thing. So I think equilibrium is probably what we're looking at. You know, we want the elephant to be able to, not to be on one leg, but to be on all four legs. Um, so I keep wondering what the last, the pandemic obviously has shocked everyone, but in particular it's shocked the universities because of the fact that they've had to completely clear out. So all of the, the huge losses that the university's taking are all almost completely related to housing. So they're, they're the biggest landlord in town and they're taking the biggest hit in town you, you know, during this. So, so um, I'm sure that the people much higher up the food chain than me at the university will take that into consideration you, you know, when they are thinking about building housing. But yeah, so for me, the critical issue is how do we balance the fact that so many of our neighbors and so many residents in Amherst are part of the university community, both use that income source, but also that, that um, the fact that there's so many 18 to 22 year olds and up, you know, in town to add to the neighborhood vitality. How do we balance that with the problems are when you have monocultures of a particular type of, or typ typical, Monocultures of a particular kind of uh, demographic in, in certain areas. Yeah, so the sustainability part, every new thing that we build, every new building that we build should be <laughs> taking as little resources from the planet as possible. So we now know that. So uh, that we know that we know that there's ways to be carbon neutral or even carbon positive. So um, the city of Cambridge actually just passed a new ordinance that is all about affordable housing. They address a lot of the issues that we're talking about, particularly student housing. So it's specifically about affordable housing with the theory being that if you're dealing with just affordable housing, then you are uh, also addressing the student issue because typically affordable housing is off limits to undergraduates who are seeking housing in, in communities, but it also deals very much with the sustainability issue. And so we might think of Cambridge, a very dense community as a place that already has addressed it by the, by the fact that it's already dense. But the fact that they're also making this a priority, I think is worth looking at. So I sent that out to actually some people from District 4 because we had a District 4 meeting last night where with a very similar conversation, but um, that might be something worth sharing with this, this entire group that's here today. Thank you, Steve. Thank you for listening. Shalini. Um, I think what was coming up for me is that as we were talking about the net zero idea in buildings and uh, whether we make it more comprehensive, I do agree with um, the example that John gave that when you have the RFPs, like we need to have this as part of our goals because it's easy to then not think about or that's where we give away or give in when it's not right in front of us as a goal. And that being said, I think we could invite the different boards and committees to look at this document and see what are the challenges they're gonna see. Like we're, with respect to environment, for example, if we want, expect the new buildings to be net zero, they can provide us the challenges we see in that is where do we get the funding or whatever, but then they can also provide us a solution like to get from zero to being net zero, there might be a path forward. Like, and we have net zero ready buildings or like they could provide us the path that even though we can't maybe achieve the full goal, but how can the new development be done in a way that it is ready for, you know, I don't know because that's something that I had read long ago is that even if you can't achieve net zero, you can be net zero ready build construction. So they are able to do that. But that's what I'm hoping is like, whether it's zoning or whether it's environment or affordable housing, you are the experts in that. And so you tell us like, we're gonna see, the, we are, we're coming up against these challenges and also then provide us some ways that we need to think about it and what are some ways we can include that in our document as the path to moving forward. Thank you. I, I see your hand, John. Is, is it a quick response so that we can get on to the measurables discussion? Yeah, I just wanted to okay. comment on what Steve said. 
uh, about the university. Um, I live on a street that has roughly 25 homes. Uh, eight or nine of them are occupied now by students. They were originally what I would call starter family homes. And that's a problem that's occurring all around Amherst. So while there certainly is a good reason to allow rentals to occupy students, it's a problem when they drive out other uh, populations that we'd like to see in town. The numbers of uh, students, uh, or, or sorry, residents that have people of school age living in them um, has dropped by a huge number since the year 2000. The number of available uh, households or residences has also dropped by a very large number since the year 2000. And we don't want to have smaller and smaller numbers of school age children and adults aged 18 or not 18, but say 25 to 45 in our community because we lose a lot. And therefore when the university doesn't provide enough appropriate housing for people on campus, it drives them off campus. And as a result, um, the town has a significant problem in the fact that we can't offer particularly starter family homes for people because the prices have been driven up by entrepreneurs buying these houses and taking advantage of the fact that there are students looking for something that would be at the same cost or even lower cost when they combine together to rent a house uh, as the university's existing housing. Thank you, John. I know, Steve, you want to respond, um, but we are going to move on um, to our next part of the housing policy discussion. And this will hopefully help us get through CRC's first review of the entire policy as drafted, because as Evan mentioned, we haven't actually even as a committee read the whole policy at a public meeting, um, even though I assume every committee member has actually read it at home in preparation of a meeting. So I wanna talk about the measurable section today. And you know there are things in the measurable section right now, and I actually don't really wanna talk about what's there. Um, what Evan suggested we talk about at last meeting to talk about this meeting was what's not there. It is the weakest section of this document because it's the hardest section probably. Um, and so I am hoping that the committee members and those um, chairs who can stay um, and want to stay can help us sort of beef up this section as we begin drafting it. Um, and before I recognize Evan, I do wanna say as we close the prior one and move on to this one, I really wanna thank um, John, and Steve, Judge, and um, Laura, and Jack, and Sarah, did I get everyone? I got everyone, um, for coming um, and for staying if they do stay to, to help us out. I think your feedback as chairs of committees um, that we're going to need to work with on this has been invaluable, at least to me, and it sounds like to the other committee members um, to essentially help us in some sense, see how wrong we were on how to seek feedback in some sense. Um, <laughs> and I'm just gonna put it that way because our conversation looked a lot different than what you guys were telling us. Um, and I think we're gonna be approaching feedback, not just for this policy, but for many other things that we do a lot differently, having heard from the, the people who would actually have to formulate that feedback um, and, and how they would want to do that. So I wanna thank you all for taking the time out of your day to come and give that to us and talk to us about that. Um, Cause I think that's a lot more valuable than us just sending an email and saying, hey, give us feedback. So that's why, why, we, why we're doing that. And, and thank you um, for, for coming and doing that. Um, so on to measurables, I know Evan's got his hand up because he's, he's the one that was really wanting to push this. So, um, but yeah, I, I think the best thing we could do right now is sort of a brainstorming on what we could actually do to measure success or movement or moving forward on any of these goals. Uh, we'll start with Evan. Okay, I have a couple of things, although it, I don't know if Jack's hand is up for this or, or if he's trying to go. So if he, if he was trying to make a statement before he goes, I'd yield so, to him. 
Thank you, Evan. I just want to say I'm going to listen and but I'm going to take off video and if that's okay. Always right. fine. You can you know, okay. just appreciate right. you taking the time out of the day. So All right. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Jack. Um, so yeah, so I was the one who wanted us to start on measurables um, because uh, when I was working with, with Mandy to sort of uh, edit and, and reorganize this policy, I felt as though the, measure, the measurable section was the section that was somewhat um, lacking. And the reason I felt that way um, was that, so first of all, all, with the exception of maybe one or two bullets, everything that's in the measurable section is just copy and pasted from the Affordable Housing Trust um, policy that was sent to us. And so it's, it's it, what they gave to us is just reproduced here, which is good. I don't want to change that. Um, but I felt like there was more that was needed because um, most of the measurables focused around production, but the policy is much broader than just production. Um, and so my, my two comments are, are this, having thought about this since our last meeting. One is measurables are there for us to literally be able to measure our progress on uh, towards a goal. Um, and I think that that makes sense for some of these, such as the you know 100 units at 80 to 100% AMI over the next five to 10 years, that's, that's literally a measurable. Some of these are not what I would actually call measurables, they're, they're deliverables, right? And so they're things like publication of a regular annual report, right? Um, a survey of local housing, authorities, those aren't actually measurables. Those are actually, um, in some way, we could actually maybe even move them into strategies, but they don't fit nicely in strategies, which is why I think they're immeasurables. So my first thought was maybe this needs to be called measurables and deliverables. But then I also sort of hate that because deliverables also mean something different. So I think part of what we need to do is disentangle the bullets we have in here and figure out where some of these things actually go. Um, and maybe maybe we even have to create yet another section. I don't know. Um, but the other thing, having heard, having you know, sat through, I, I spent a lot of time when I was looking at this, trying to think of measurables that we could come up with. You know, what could we actually use as a measurable? And things like, you know, if we're trying to increase housing affordability, maybe it's actually looking at rents over time, right? Or maybe it's actually looking at median house price over time, right? It's tricky. Um, or I know the housing trust in there, um, with a section that they call policy justification talked about, um, I think it was in that document or at least some document from the housing trust about the percentage of renters who were and homeowners who were cost burdened or severely cost burdened. So I think right now it's something like 60% of renters are cost burdened or severely cost burdened. And so depending on the regularity of that data, you could say, okay, well, in five years, we want that number to be 55%. The reality is I'm just going to be pulling things out of thin air based on data we have and just picking um, percentages. And so this gets me to my second point, which is given the conversation we just had with chairs, I'm wondering actually if we shouldn't put too much pressure on ourselves to de develop these measurables. And instead that can be part of the feedback we get from committees, because I, I don't know if percentage of renters that are cost burdened is a useful statistic to try to track over time to assess success at achieving these goals. And if it is, what the appropriate numbers would be as far as measurables go. But the members of the Affordable Housing Trust would certainly have a, have a better grip on that because they understand that data a little bit more. Um, in the draft we have, I wrote the bullet that, um, under sustainability in alignment with Animar's Climate Action Plan, a blank percentage reduction in emissions. And I left that blank because I literally don't know what that number should be. But the members of ECAC probably have some semblance um, what that is. And so I guess I'm, I'm wondering if maybe we shouldn't spend too, too much time trying to, for us trying to come up with measurables and instead actually ask some of the committee and boards that have members with expertise in some of these things to suggest memorables, uh, measurables. Because I think the ones that we have that, I, the, that are firmer, which are the production ones, came from the Affordable Housing Trust and not from the council or not from me, which makes me have more confidence in them than if I just pick numbers out of a hat, which is what I would have done. Thank you, Evan. John. Um, 
I appreciate Evan's acknowledgement of the work that the Affordable Housing Trust has done. And I do see when I read through it, um, various elements of the policy that we had recommended. So I think that's great. Um, we did have uh, a set of, I can't remember, eight or 10 uh, things that we included as data, as a justification, as Evan said, of the policy, although we put it in an appendix because we were concerned that putting it in the main document might put people off. Uh, so we left it in an appendix for better or worse. Um, but that provides uh, some idea about what the measurables might be. As Evan said, one of them has to do with the percentage of uh, renters that are cost burdened. There are others like um, how much new housing there is on the university campus to serve students, particularly as a ratio of the growth of the student body. And of course, there's nothing now really, frankly, that we can rely on. And there won't be until probably a, a year or so after the pandemic uh, is under control. Uh, but nonetheless, you have a set of things there that could be potentially used to justify uh, the policies that you are developing. And you may there may be other things that are available that aren't there that you could use to justify policies. And then they become potential measurables that uh, you can also use to develop objectives. Uh, there, I mean, there are lots of things. I, Evan did note that you adopted the number of, I think, uh, affordable housing units to be developed, which was 250 in your draft document. But for other goals of pr production, which I personally think are important, there aren't any specific goals. So I think you need to go back and look at the general production goals and ask what numbers you would like to see and why. So that's my first comment on measurables and I'll leave it at there for the moment. Thank you, John. Sarah. Uh, just wondering um, how, how you think this policy, how easily this policy will be able to change and grow over time. I imagine the more detail, if it takes two years to develop it and six months to, let's say, have council approve it, then that's not something you want to be doing every year. So. Have you thought about um, how, how to incorporate um, what the town learns from experience? Um, maybe a policy is more high level and it directs some kind of regular updating as to the specific, what the measurables should be. You know, maybe you wanna, after, after a year you discover, oh, well, it would really be useful to have these two other things. So just a thought. No, thank you. I, I, that goes to which, which statistics are the ones we should be looking at, I think. And we may not know until we try to compile them after a year um, and find out that that one's really hard and tells us nothing. And this one over here tells us a lot more. Um, I think there are, I don't see any other hands. Um, I'm just going to throw out some of the ideas I had. Um, some of them mirrored some of what John said. Now, I, I don't have numbers, but I think for increase of production, you know, we can really track how many units we're actually creating a year, how many through permitting and all of that. Um, and I, it's just not there yet, because um, I think part of that is we haven't actually put anything in there other than some of the things that were there um, in the housing trust policy. Um, for something like safe and secure and healthy housing, things I came up with were maybe we can track evictions or rental registration complaints, um, violations from the inspections department. You know, Steve mentioned that isn't, or I, I think it was Steve Judge, but maybe one someone mentioned that much of this is building commission 
and something you, that the zoning bylaw requires or the building, I guess the building code requires. So could we track some of that through those complaints and either, and I'm not even sure whether less complaints would be better or more complaints would be better. Um, and, and that sounds really weird to say more complaints might be better, but if we're aiming for education on what people, what tenants rights are, hearing about violations is actually a good sign that you're getting that education to the right people. Um, you know, and so those were some potential options I thought about, um, you know, for climate sustainability, it's more, it goes to the deliverables, has the zoning been modified? Um, you know, for some of these, when the strategies are actual zoning amendments, have we amended the zoning bylaws to that? Um, and so, you know, that, that, that was some of the things I came up with as potential statistics. Um, anyone else have anything to add to the potential for some of these? You guys are all very quiet today. John. Um, I'll just go back to something that Sarah said uh, about the policy. I think it is important to get it out there. Um, oh, now I'm losing my thought about what, what Sarah had said. That how I flexible to... it is, how open it'll be to change and modification from experience. Yeah, I think all of that is important. Um, but also, I remember now you talked about really implementation and uh, kind of what happens after the policy's out. Uh, one of the things I wanted to say is the, one of the great weaknesses of the master plan, um, which in many ways is kind of at the level of the major goals that you've set for yourself, um, is that little or nothing is said about objectives and about how the plan would be implemented. And as a consequence, for the most part, it sat on a shelf um, since it was completed. And I would not want to see this plan uh, sit on a shelf after it's completed. So I think it is important to think about when you have a goal and then you got an objective and then you have uh, a specific evaluation that you'd like to do, how it's gonna get implemented, how it's gonna go from A to Z and uh, think about why it hasn't been implemented before. Because when you look at most of these ideas, uh, you'd think, oh, we should already be doing them. Why aren't we further along than we are? So thinking, for example, about why developers in general don't look to work on affordable housing. Um, and I think as somebody may have said, it it's doesn't fit with their business model for the most part. And they object to all the paperwork that's involved in trying to get the subsidy that would be associated with affordable housing. I mentioned Tom Kegelman before. I know he's had conversations with uh, the for-profit developers who are in town and that's the feedback that he gets and even though there are options to deal with the paperwork issues or understand how best to apply uh, in general they're not interested so we don't see that happening thank you um, any other thoughts on measurables? Um, I, you know, at, at some point, I guess I, I've been the one that's sort of been doing the main drafting. I know Evan has helped me. He, he's the one that reorganized the strategy section tremendously um, to get it to where it is now. Um, we're gonna have to add stuff to it. Um, I, I foresee next meeting as being the meeting where we try to get through the strategies so that, and then so that we can get this out to all the committees at, at the request that they wanted the whole thing. And then even if we're continuing every meeting to modify it and regularly send it out to the committees for that 
that comment, but we'll have that discussion at the next meeting in January. But any other thoughts um, on measurables, ones to add that people might want to see as I add things to the sections add, added? Um, again, it'll be probably with blanks in them too. You know, as, as Evan said, we can say the measurable is this X number of houses, but we don't know what that number is supposed to be or what's a logical number or anything, um, but we can put in that as an idea. Steve. Yeah, uh, I've been pondering the complaints. Ah, it says my connection's unstable. Um, I've been pondering the complaint issue. So there, you know, there is a, there is a map property complaints that you can look at. And it's mostly, um, well, it's both zoning complaints and building code complaints. But what's interesting about that is in order to have a complaint, you have to have a complainer. So the complainers are more the kind of, actually John was talking about his own street where maybe there's a mix of owner occupied houses and other, you know, uh, other renters. I, I'll bet that the studies show that the owner occupants are more likely to call in a complaint than renters calling in about other renters. So actually when there's a disappearance of complaints, that is a, could be a sign that this monoculture that, I, that some of us are concerned about, you know, of all, you know, um, no longer a mix of housing or, or whatever, that could be a sign of that. But it, it's an interesting point that you brought that I'm pondering, but um, I also worry that a lack of complaints could be a sign that a neighborhood has gone in a particular direction that's not um, necessarily favorable. Also, the other thing is property quality. So I was actually looking at the property cards to see if that's true in Amherst, but a lot of property cards in some communities have a measurement of housing quality and that housing quality is used as a factor in determining this, the assessment. And I don't know enough about how to read the Amherst or Massachusetts property cards to see if that is a factor that's recorded. But that would be another thing to consider is the property assessor's indication of property quality. Thank you. Any other comments? Evan. Yeah, so I guess I'm wondering if maybe, um, if, I don't know how to put this, if it would be okay to just we, so we, we mentioned, I'm not being very articulate here, we mentioned sort of a bunch of statistics, right, um, that we could use. And then, of course, the question is, are they useful? What, um, what does it mean, right? So like this, we're having this conversation right now about complaints. Is less complaints a good thing or is it a bad thing? You could read it either way, right? Um, and then if they are useful and if we do know how to read them, sort of what the numbers should be or what the trends that we're looking for. Um, and so I guess I'm wondering if it makes sense to just sort of much like with the strategy section, we sort of just threw everything in there. Um, if maybe between now and the next meeting, if we have ideas, we could just email you of and, and it. it just a statistic, like, like I said, like medium home price, and you could just put median home price. And then, then we can sort of through this process of vetting through the CRC and also the committees figure out sort of those three questions. Is it useful? What, what can we glean from this and how do we read it? And then what the number should be? Because I, I don't know that I have specifics that I could give, I can give off the top of my head, but I could probably give more. Um, but I don't, I, I, I hadn't come that prepared because I was struggling to figure out how to pitch it, but maybe if we do this sort of everything and then pare down or, or refine, that could be a good way to do it. Yeah, no, I'm happy to take suggestions as I modify the section for the next meeting and add to draft. I think it'll be nine or 10. I don't know what number we're on. Um, it'll be in the twenties or thirties by the time we finish it, I'm sure. <laughs> but um, as I, as I prepare new drafts, I'm happy to take suggestions on what to add to that section, John, and then Shalini. Um, going back to the complaint issue, I have heard a lot, mostly indirectly, occasionally a, a particular person talk about problems with their landlords that don't necessarily get transmitted to anybody in a, as a formal complaint, but nonetheless are a problem. Um, for example, uh, 
things don't get fixed in an apartment that's rented. And even though that should be a requirement, uh, nothing is done. So you do have those kinds of unspoken complaints, but they exist. Um, we might develop or talk about developing some kind of survey of households that are renters, particularly in the uh, larger developments that exist in Amherst, uh, which include both families and students. Uh, related to that, one of the things that I can't remember if it got into this document, but was part of your earlier consideration of plans from other communities is the idea of providing an incentive program for landlords in which you give them money for um, improving the quality of their properties. And in return, they give you something else. Um, it could be making the properties more affordable or it could be just improving the quality of those rents, uh, rental units itself is enough for you to want to go forward with a program like that. Thank you, Shalini. Yeah, I just wanted to close the loop on a um, couple of things that have come up today. One is uh, John suggesting the CRC non-voting number and just as an agenda item or something that we can decide among, but have a discussion on that because I think that's a really good idea. The other thing, I think we can send the email to different, come now with this, everyone was asking like, what comments do you want? But I think we have more clarity around what are some challenges they're seeing or goals that they would might like to add or remove challenges that they in, foresee happening in implementation of these goals and the path forward, like what would be the tentative solutions that they've already brainstormed earlier and then the measurables. So I think sending them that would be helpful. Um, the third thing yeah, I was thinking also was incentivizing landlords who take care of the rented properties because I've heard that as well, that a lot of the houses that are rented out to students don't actually get taken care of as well, but there's no way, um, I don't know. So creating some kind of incentivization to reward the landlords who actually do care, take care of their properties. The other thing that was just coming up for me is regarding this there's some developers like Beacon who've got it down the, you know, that's their business, that's their business model is to process the papers in affordable housing and so forth. So is there a way for us to reach out to them? I mean, we live in a capitalist society and to expect that people are not going to rent to students when you have a house that's lying vacant and no family is coming in or you have students coming in and paying more, I can see that it, I mean, it is our neighbors who are selling their homes to developers to rent it out and to, it is our neighbors renting out to students because, yeah. So I don't know how we can ever compete with that living in a capitalist society where we are looking to maximize our own and everyone does have struggles and whatnot. So there, so part of the solution is, uh, again, coming back to something like a gateway project or something, we're going into a different strategy, but like, you know, I think that's there is one of the strategies is creating that student centered homes. It could be public private um, venture on campus or somewhere around downtown, between downtown and campus where we do have, but we need to find some solution where students can have you know, housing rather than expecting and thinking that we're going to somehow be able to not have them continue to take over some of our starter homes. Because if we don't provide an alternative, nothing's going to change. I mean, so. yeah. No. Thank you, Shalini. Steve. Yeah. So, you know, I think John, I think that was his opening statement about um, including the voices of developers. So frankly, profit developers or nonprofit developers, 
I think both, you know, both voices are really important to, to understand. And it's long been a frustration that there isn't a good avenue other than through the bid or something like that for, you know, people who are really in the housing development business can weigh in on decisions that are being made by, you know, zoning decisions or, or whatever. I would very much welcome the voice and I would include the, so every for-profit housing developer becomes a nonprofit developer if they trip the inclusionary zoning bylaw. So, so there's, you know, lots of experience or an increasing amount of experience with, you know, that also. I don't know exactly how to do that, um, you know, other than, I don't know how to do that. Um, and I think probably some of us have had private conversations with developers who, you know, give us information about, you know, um, how to make our common goals work, but it would be great to do that in that open forum. I think that um, actually John hit on someone whose work was not, may or may not be in Amherst itself. So if the developers are working in Amherst and they're from Amherst, then that becomes, they get worried about, you know, certain issues. But if we have, you know, people amongst us that are working primarily not in Amherst, but have lots of experience um, developing affordable housing, market rate housing, I, I would welcome that. Thank you. Any, any other thoughts? So I will take this, I will um, add to the measurable section if anyone comes up with statistics or other concrete sort of items that could be potentially a measurable um, for adding in so that we could then talk about a little more specifically, but also the committees could talk about themselves a little more specifically. Let me know um, for that. Our next meeting is January um, 12th. Uh, we are not meeting two weeks from today. We are not meeting between in late December. So we will have approximately a month till the next meeting. Um, in the meantime, if this committee agrees, I will update the policy, but I will also send it out um, back out to the committees that, that we've discussed um, so that they have an updated one, the full policy, not just the abbreviated one. Um, with some of the questions that we've asked, but also with a um, be on the lookout in the future that this is just a follow up to the December 15th meeting. We'll discuss a little more formally in January, more feedback loop type things, but, but here it is, feel free to begin discussions with your committees if you want. Um, and here's some other things that we thought might be useful. Um, I, I will work on doing that in the meantime too. Uh, Evan. So uh, not to add to that, um, but uh, I, we, I think we heard from the previous discussion several things that some of the chairs felt um, were absent from the policy um, or could be useful to have. And so I guess I'm wondering uh, at, at some point, it doesn't have to be now, maybe it's at the January 12th meeting, we should talk about um, whether we also want to include those. So I, you know, what I wrote down and I don't remember who said which, so I'm not gonna to try to attribute, um, but there was some mention of barriers um, that it, it makes sense to have goal, barrier to that goal and strategies. So the strategy, we can understand the strategies instead of just going goals to strategies. Um, there was a comment about um, identifying sort of who is responsible for implementing the different strategies. I, you know, sort of, I, I'm assuming similar to like the housing production plan, identified responsible parties. Um, there were several comments about the absence of UMass from the policy um, and uh, something about the broader context of the policy, similar to what the housing trust did um, with the, uh, I think they labeled it policy justification um, that shows sort of the situation, uh, the, the data to back up some of this stuff. They included it as an appendix. I, I don't know if we'd wanna do that or work it into the policy. And then something that I believe came from Sarah, which is, um, I'm wondering, there's a question about how easy, how flexible it is to revise, um, but also, you know, timelines for doing so. And, and which made me, this is exactly what you were saying, but made me think if we'd wanna have something in there about 
or thinking or some conversation about um, revisions to the policy, you know, whether or not it's something that's formal, like we have in our charter, you know, we get a new master plan every 20 years, like a new the housing policy needs to be updated every 60 years or something, or if it's something informal, but, but maybe start thinking about that. Um, so those are the five things I heard from chairs um, that they felt would be useful or missing that I feel like at some point we should have a conversation about whether we want to include. Okay, thank you. Uh, Shalini. Yeah, and I think we didn't talk about when, at what point we want to include public, public comment or include the, and have a way to maybe not just the usual uh, hearings because not everyone, but like people who are impacted, renters and all who generally don't come. I don't know if you want to think of a way to reach out and create multiple channels, whether it's online surveys, whether it's on the website, town website, we have a place where people can send in emails or something that's prominent that, hey, we're working on the housing policy and these, these, these things or, and then also what specific questions do we want? Like, I don't, I mean, people can say, oh, I want this X, Y, Z. I mean, that's not what this is. It's not like people's wish list, but it's more to understand where, what are the challenges people are encountering with respect to their homes as it pertains to the quality and safety of their homes or availability or, so we can have specific questions where we are looking for people's feedback on their lived experiences in town. And then we use that to inform the solutions. Thank you for that. I, you're gonna hate me, mm -hmm. Shalini. Why don't you come to the next meeting <laughs> with, with yeah. a proposal for sure. public feedback? Um, Love it. That, yep. you know, so instead of us starting from scratch, we're starting mm. with a proposal to discuss on you know, how we would mm. do it, what, what forms that might take, what multiple forms it might take, um, and even potentially questions. Um, Love it. Happy to and, do and that. And I will make sure it's on the agenda. Okay. Yeah, you suggest it, you get the work. <laughs> yeah, no, fair enough. That's absolutely. <laughs> no, so it's, it's, it's certainly worse. for bringing it up. It's one thing I actually didn't get to mm. ask the chairs of each of the committees, which was we need pu public feedback and where are some mm -hmm. ideas for how to do it. So, so let's start mm -hmm. that discussion in full at yeah. the next meeting. Um, we can send out what I create and send to you. We can send it out to them as a starting point, but then they can add their questions or yeah, we'll, and, we'll, we'll yeah. start with us on the 12th oh, okay. and yeah, then, yeah. and then it's, you know, one thing I got from, from all of the chairs of the committees mm -hmm. was more regular uh, communication between mm -hmm. us and the chairs on, and those committees on policy and what we want and what their thoughts are and all not just one time now and one time in four months, you know, almost, so I'm almost envisioning the potential need for you know maybe a monthly email to all the relevant committees for here's the next update on this type thing um, to to keep that line of communication open. Um, so so you'll come to come with a proposal that we can put in and have for discussion on public feedback um, for the next meeting. Um, we have morphed into on the agenda, um, agenda, next agenda preview, we will come back to that because I wanna make sure we get in public comment um, for now. Um, so for public comment, we're gonna to move to public comment right now and it's anything within the jurisdiction of CRC. Um, public can speak for up to three minutes um, and if you want to speak, I believe we have someone on the phone. So for the phone public comment, if the person on the phone would like to make public comment, you will need to press um, star nine on your phone. Otherwise, just hit the raise hand button if you've joined from Zoom, not from, from the phone, from just the computer, um, just hit the raise hand button and I will recognize everyone in turn. Um, so. Um, if there's anyone who would like to make public comment, please raise your hand now or hit star nine now. It appears there's, uh, there is one person who would like to make public comment. So I will work on recognizing Pam Rooney. Um, I think you should be able to unmute now, Pam. 
Yep, thank you. This is a very, very mundane uh, comment. And I thank everyone who's put a lot of effort into putting this policy together. Um, in the past, when I've worked on goals and objectives and strategies, um, it's very helpful to have the goals, which you start off by, by listing the goal, um, but then to put your priority statement under that, and then you put your objectives, but to have to scroll down through four or five or six pages to get to some of the measurables that deal with the first objective is discombobulating. So in your organization of it, uh, you have what, two, four, five goals. If it were possible to clump everything together, um, it just helps sort of you, you understand the linkage between your actions and your actual goal and not have to scroll back 20 pages to find that goal. <laughs> Thank you for that. I think I'm hearing a, a vote for the previous format instead of the new format. <laughs> We've changed this format a couple times. So um, I, I think that's what, what Pam's going for is uh, she liked the old format that didn't have them, that had the strategies <laughs> and measurables directly under the goal, the listing of the goal and the objective. Um, so it just helps. Well, my mind works differently than yours, perhaps. So it just helps link, link those things together. Um, the other comment that I would make is that it, it's, um, it's interesting to understand that you, in your formulation of stuff, you, you sort of dump everything into piles and say, okay, we're gonna sort it out later. We're gonna put the, the possibles, the impossibles, I think Evan said, into, into that strategy bucket. And we're gonna let the, the committees sort through those and we'll sort through those later. Um, I just wanna reflect that it, it, it feels a little bit like the same approach that being made with the zoning that you all uh, are making recommendations on to council where it's like we've thrown all of these ideas into the bucket and um, we're now going to have to pull them apart and see you know which which of those uh, little little strategies works because right now there are over a dozen zoning actions um, and and so far no analysis have, has been done on them. Anyway, that's a whole different topic. I think the work here is great and that certainly can help um, inform how some of the zoning should work in order to support these goals. So great job. Thank you, Pam. Thank is, there you. Any, is there any other public comment? Seeing none, I'm going to recognize Sarah, who may or may not want to make a formal public comment, but she's in the meeting. Sure, just as, as a <laughs> public sure comment. Cover your hand, Sarah. Thank, <laughs> thank you, and I know you don't um, need need to respond, so I'll just say I'm I'm curious about some of the concerns that have been folded into the or included in this draft document, and I just I just well I'll I'll spell them out. Um, the concerns having to do with evictions and with repairs to rental property or violations of codes. These things to me sound like matters of enforcing legal protections or, or regulations that are on the books. So I, you know, I wonder why those need to be called out here as opposed to encouraging the town manager to have his <laughs> staff, you know, get busy and, and uh, you know, whatever, that there are already avenues for dealing with those. And if there are no, let's say if the concerns with evictions or repairs uh, go beyond what is required by law, whether you really think a policy is going to cause any change. Um, that's one thing. And then there are, I think, some um, hopes or concerns about the uh, energy use of, of uh, or, um, yeah, of new construction. And I wonder whether, I mean, the town has a building code, you know, if, and maybe that's the place to fold in that kind of requirement as opposed to kind of dump, putting in a lot of things that have to do with housing that aren't about 
creating additional housing. So that that's my comment. Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. John. I just wanted to say the town manager, I believe, has no authority related to preventing evictions. Uh, we don't have an eviction moratorium. If we did in town, and there are towns in Massachusetts, like Somerville, that actually do have eviction moratoriums that go into force because the state is not doing that. Uh, so uh, it's important to recognize that. There are other things, though, that the town council could potentially do. For example, the housing trust is looking at uh, the Housing Stability Notification Act that Somerville and I think Cambridge and uh, Boston at least have adopted in some form. So that's also something the town could adopt and we're looking into it and we may recommend it. But there are things that other towns are doing that we can look at that will deal with some of the issues um, that, uh, that you've raised. Thank you, John. Um... At this time, I'm looking at our agenda. Uh, I will say we don't have minutes at all to, to deal with today. They weren't in the packet. They're just not ready yet. So we will deal with minutes next time. Uh, are there any announcements? Seeing none, next agenda preview. We already previewed it a little bit in addition to that. It is likely that, um, well, there will be the 2021 meeting schedule on the agenda for, for viewing and passing. Um, I've already drafted it. It's just, it will, it will go on the next agenda for January 12th, um, which is our next meeting. And then it is suspected that we will have um, potentially Sarah back here um, for, but, but I'm not sure who, um, for, a, it might be John, um, Belchertown Road, there's a CPA request that is out of cycle, I guess is what it's been called, um, that is likely to be presented to the council at the meeting on the 21st, this coming Monday, um, for referral to both CRC and FinCom for um, you know, review and recommendation back to the council by the second January meeting um, for an appropriation for CPA money. I don't know whether there's borrowing involved or not for some some housing, I think that CPA, well, so a, a purchase of land, I think that CPA recommended. So that is likely to be on our December, uh, January 12th agenda to review. Um, so we might see, I'm not sure who's going to be doing that presentation if it gets referred, but it might be someone from the housing trust. It might be someone from CPA committee. We might see a few of you guys back on the 12th again, um, or it might just be staff doing that. I'm just not sure. Um, so those are the other things I have for potential agenda items. Um, that I'm looking towards on January 12th. Are there any other agenda items besides what we talked about that people would like me to consider and try and get on the agenda? Seeing none, um, I, I know Athena published the, the addendum to the CRC report. So I just want to, in this meeting, since it is a CRC meeting, for the upcoming town council meeting. I wanna thank Evan for his work on that addendum. Um, I will thank him at the council meeting too. If you, it, it relates to the zoning provisions, um, recommendations that we made to the council. There's an addendum report. Um, I recommend you read it, it's long. So thank you, Evan, for all the work you did with that. I, I hope that, my hope is that it, it answers many of the questions that the councilors had at the last meeting regarding this committee's recommendations on zoning. Um, but I thought I'd recognize Evan for all the work he did to essentially create that addendum um, with my editing review of it. So I appreciate you stepping in to do that, Evan. Um, with that, um, I don't have any unanticipated items. Does anyone else? Seeing none, I want to thank again um, Steve and John and Sarah and Jack and Laura who left at three for attending the meeting, listening, giving your input, giving your feedback, helping us figure out how best we can incorporate your committees into um, drafting and reviewing and getting this housing policy to the council. So thank you all. I'm going to adjourn the meeting at 4.03 p.m. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Happy safe holidays.
Thank you for involving us. Thank you for coming.